Okay, we're underway. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Good to see you, Glenn. It's been a long time. We've seen each other face to face, even so. It has been. I, I agree. This is Glenn Lowry at the Glenn Show at BloggingHeads.tv, uh, and I'm with James Heckman, who's the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor. Uh, at the University of Chicago and director of, what is it, Center for Economics of Human Development. Uh, the very distinguished economist, winner of the Nobel Prize, shared it in the year 2000 for his work in uh, censored samples, a heterogeneous uh, population, microeconometrics. I'm not an econometrician. J tell us what you actually got the prize for. But uh, <laughs> I, I can remember as a young labor economist when they would say, yeah, well, you got a sample selection bias problem, and you have to do the Heckman technique, and uh, I assume it has something to do with that. <laughs> well, yep, it's the problem remains. There are more solutions. <laughs> okay, um, so Jim Heckman, very distinguished economist, University of Chicago, and um, we're just here to talk about this and that. Uh, I'm especially interested in the issue of race and racial inequality and persisting racial disparities and, and how one wants to think about that as a, prof as a professional economist and the quality of the debate. But I'm also just interested in uh, what's going on. How are things in Chicago these days, Jim? Well, in terms of race as a general topic, yeah. we have a black mayor, and you probably know that, Lori Lightfoot. Yes. Uh, and she's made uh, racial justice not only a mayor, but the head of the Cook County uh, board as well. So Tony Preckwinkle. So there are two females, both African-American, and they've both been interested in racial justice issues, especially about African-Americans. So it's very prominent in the uh, public discussion. And I happen to live in Hyde Park, which is on the south side of the city where you were born. And I yes. was born too. So we're both we're both, I'm still back in the home base. You migrated away a long time ago. But uh, yes, I, uh, I think there's a consciousness that was uh, maybe heightened by the events of last summer, the, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations that turned violent and that created a situation of racial tension in some neighborhoods. Uh, and it, it created a kind of dialogue which continues sometimes a very unhealthy dialogue, but it's kind of a dialogue that's been enhanced by a lot of idealistic young students, many from the University of Chicago, also some from the University of Illinois at Chicago, Northwestern, trying to bring into the whole discussion their idealism and their perception about what a good society would be. And so it's led to a lot of rhetoric, which is sometimes not very helpful, Sometimes, but it's, there's a naive idealism. I've, I've been around the groups. I've seen a lot of the discussion. I remember, I mean, I'm not, I know I'm old now, but I remember being young and I remember having these same kinds of passions in uh, an era about 50, 55 years ago and sharing them. So it's, I understand that. I, it's just the lack of reality that is on the part of a lot of these students. They're demanding things that they don't really they don't really want if they understood what's going on. Like, for example, defund oh, defunding the police. Yeah. It's become a big issue, both in the public schools, even at the University of Chicago. How the police presence at the University of Chicago is pretty, pretty benign. There isn't a lot of uh, racial friction, and the police are pretty non intrusive here. So, now Hyde Park remains a, uh, racially integrated uh, community? Uh, is it mostly University of Chicago affiliated people? Or is it is a mix in a socioeconomic uh, level? Um, uh, is, is there a lot of uh, crime and uh, whatnot in uh, the Hyde Park area? Is that a factor? Well, let me put it this way. There is, it's a racially mixed area. And I think it has been for the last 70 years since urban renewal. This was really one of the first urban renewal districts in the whole country, like the 1950s. Uh, now it's racially mixed, and it's a mix of professionals. Where I live, there are a lot of very highly professional people, uh, some African-American, some just straight African. My neighbor right next to me is a very distinguished um, uh, uh, breast uh, researcher on breast cancer, uh, Fumio Olapati, and she's world-renowned. So we actually have... Uh, but she's a Nigerian, so we there's a uh, there's a mix, and there are a lot of it's black and white. 
this neighborhood is definitely not universally one or the other. A lot of university presence. Though. The provost lives down the street. Obama lived two blocks down uh, when he was still living in Chicago. So when he was in the Senate and when he was doing community activism, he was living two blocks from here. And uh, he would come by with his kids and trick-or-treating. So I met him and his daughters at my front door. And a totally different, uh, totally different life and a totally different way. God, so he's, he's, gone a, he's traveled a long way from there, I, I would say. Well, he has and he hasn't because some of his very best friends are living still in this vicinity. I mean, Chicago plays a very important role. And there is this Obama presidential center. Yeah, I can't, is, that's controversial, the presidential center. It is for a couple of reasons, though, and they're different. The one reason is because it is going to chew up a lot of valuable parkland. Jackson Park was built by Olmsted. It was created in, uh, in the 1890s. It was a, a site for the World's Fair in the 1890s. And it's parkland. I go down there a lot to walk. There's a golf course there. Uh, there's a great place called Wooded Isle. I don't know if you know it. I know it. I used to live not far from Jackson Park. Okay. Well, Jackson Park is a great place. And it's a place the community uses. Both, it's, it's black and white. There really isn't any, any fear as far as I can see. Is the People beach still there? What's that? Uh, there used to be a beach there uh, oh, as there well. there is a beach. Yeah. If you just walk out from Jackson Park, out into a lot of different passageways, you're on Lake Michigan. And there are a lot of very famous, famous in history and, and well-used beaches. And then there's something called the Point, which is a place uh, which jets out into Lake Michigan and has been a traditional meeting place for the University of Chicago. And it has beaches just very close by. So, yeah, it's a community which actually is, is very integrated racially. Uh, there is crime, as you were mentioning, but I don't think it's the high crime neighborhood in Chicago by any means. Yeah. OK, so that's the presidential center. But does Obama have any presence in Chicago anymore at all? Well, he does. He comes around off and on. Uh, the presidential center has created controversy. I didn't quite finish my thought. Mm-hmm. Part of it is that it's chewing up the park. But a second is that it's leading to gentrification of the Woodlawn area that's immediately surrounding Jackson Park and where the Obama presidential center will be. And so there's a group of individuals who are representing the, the persons who feel that their rents will go up, that their way of life will be threatened, yeah. and that eventually they want to keep things as they were. So the gentrification is opposed. And it's, a, it's not just a group of individuals. These are politicians who don't want to lose their constituents. So it's been, it's been a mess. I think it's going to go through. The problem was the way it was settled. We had this abrasive mayor called Rahm Emanuel. And I truly hope he doesn't get into the cabinet. I, a lot of people in Chicago just can't stand to look at him or listen to him. But in this particular case, uh, you know, he kind of jammed it on to the city and it didn't get the kind of due process that I think it probably deserved. So, and it's not, and, and to be honest, my, there's a third view out there. The third view is that just to the West, of the University of Chicago. As yeah. we go into Inglewood, there's something called Washington Park. And that area has been a cultural desert. It's been an area which is underdeveloped, has lots of free land. Yeah. And if the Obama Presidential Center had gone there, it would have been a spur to community development. It would have been yeah. a shot in the arm for the neighborhood. And the, the DuSable Museum is not that far away either. So it would have rejuvenated this whole area and why Obama group didn't go there, I don't know. It really, the land would have been cheaper, the, the controversy would have been eliminated, and so forth and so on. So, so what did you make of uh, the rioting on North Michigan Avenue? I mean, you had to be turned on your television. So do you live uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that vicinity? Oh, no, you oh, said no. you live in Hyde Park. I live in Hyde Park. I live in Kenwood, actually, so just north of Hyde Park. But it's, yeah. it's, it's the adjoining neighborhood, yeah. No, we had rioting, too. By the way, on 47th Streets, many of the stores were looted in June or in May, late May, early June. And there was, a, there, were a, there was a lot of turmoil only in the commercial districts. It never got into the, never got into the neighborhoods where I live. And, and I don't think it really affected anybody in terms of personal living situation 
a few cars got in the way. So, but what did I make of it? I was very yeah. deeply, I was distressed. I, I felt, you know, when, uh, in the old days, if you want to go back to that quote, good old days, or at least go back to the old days, uh, Mayor Daly, remember the way he responded to the riots in the 60s? Shoot to kill. Shoot to kill. But there was a sense in which law was enforced. The current mayor was very, very lax. And there were, there were photos, not just down in Michigan Avenue, but also in the neighborhoods, which were really raked over. The Chatham area and the area south, Auburn, Auburn Gresham, many of those merchants were destroyed, had their whole livelihoods destroyed. And uh, this, this had nothing to do with racial justice. These were African-American owners, African-American locals, and African-American rioters. But the mayor was afraid to act. She's been very afraid to take on situations. And so as a result, there was this bizarre spectacle of the police standing outside shopping areas that were being looted and letting the looters run past them, observing them, not, t- not stopping them. And so that's, that's not shoot to kill, that's for sure, but it does seem like it was a very lax enforcement of the law. And so the, the chief of police was actually quite unhappy, I think. So there has been this kind of feeling of threat, and I think there's this undercurrent that many people feel, not just in Chicago, but in the whole country, that if things don't go a certain way, especially favorable to African Americans, that the threat of violence is there. It's a veiled threat. And sometimes it comes out of the, and comes out as no longer veiled. And that was the case in Chicago. So people oh. were, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I would imagine that could uh, foster a lot of uh, resentment uh, in the minds of people who are, who are threatened by this. I think it does. And I don't think it's just white people. I don't think it's just sure. Hispanics. Don't forget, Chicago has a funny racial, it was a very balanced racial composition. It's close to a third, a third, a third. The Hispanics play a very powerful role, but politically, they're not even around. They literally aren't playing a role. And so as a result, I, my impression is dealing with Hispanics and talking to Hispanic people, not, not so many, but, um, you know, individuals I deal with and some of their representatives is that there's a feeling that they're being neglected in all this, that somehow, you know, that they are, and they have, and they don't feel a lot of affinity with the African-American rioting in particular. They don't like that. They, so there's a very much more of an assimilationist point of view among the Hispanics than there is among some of the African-Americans. But there's a huge number. I mean, if you look at my neighbors who are, I would guess, at least half African-Americans, most of these people, I mean, <laughs> You couldn't see any difference looking at the houses. You might see a difference when people drove out by seeing literally their physical appearance. But other than that, there's living, coexisting. There's no, there'll be a few more Black Lives Matter signs on and probably some, some houses than others. But it's, there's nothing oppressive. It's not like we're in South Africa or dealing with some kind of segregated and fearful society. But the, yes, it is. You've been studying uh among many other things uh racial inequality discrimination the effectiveness of civil rights programs uh, uh the extent of uh, african american progress and whatnot uh and i gather that the status of african americans has improved dramatically since the middle of the 20th century it's one of the great stories uh to tell uh, how how come there is uh such racial discontent uh, in the land. I mean, it seems like this problem, uh, this issue for American society, the, you know, American dilemma, as Murdoch put it, uh, is ever, is ever present. It doesn't look like there's any way, like there's any way out. I mean, I'm, I'm becoming very pessimistic about it, actually. Well, I, if you want my personal opinion, I think it's strictly a matter that's politically, fa- it, it favors the politics of certain groups. It favors, I think, the idea of creating classes of victims, whether it's Trump's victims or whether it's the victims on the other side, uh, literally has created a divide, which is very unhealthy. I think, and this has been discussed by many people, and I will just reiterate, but I think there is a tremendous, just like I mentioned, the opposition to the Obama presidential center. 
there were politicians on the south side here living nearby in Woodlawn who really saw that their constituents might be priced out and might not have to not be able to live. And so they wanted to stop development. And so there really is a sense that a group of people, professional, a professional grievance people, I would say, have too much in stake. Wait a minute, they want to stop development to keep the neighborhood's population stable so that their voters would not move away? That's a huge issue, yes. Their voters and their support, yes. People are getting statements saying, look, our rent's going to go up. We're going to have to leave. You say, no, these are our people. And so there's a sense of ownership. You know, they've lived there for, what, 30, 40 years? Well. And, and so forth. So I understand that. But there could be ways to deal with this more more discreetly. Have you been down to 63rd Street recently? I have not. It's been many years since I was on 63rd Street. You go to 63rd Street and you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked because what you will see is a middle class neighborhood of houses, mostly townhouses, that have been developed by a couple of churches in the vicinity that have bought up all the vacant land that went that went idle during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Churches. And now, Churches, yes, big, big apostolic church here mm-hmm. that's very cool. It's a huge church complex, but what they've done is they've actually invested in the neighborhood and they've created a black middle class in that area. I mean, and and most people feel very safe. I feel perfectly safe. I go down and have coffee at 63rd Street and even further south. The area south of the University of Chicago has gone pretty upscale. You know, there, there, there are bed and breakfast places that people stay in, black and white. Bed and breakfast places. Yes, yes. I had Angela Duckworth here a few years ago, and she found this on her own. There was a bed and breakfast place that was just south. It was close to 63rd Street. A nice, beautiful old house, great housing stock. And the architecture is beautiful around there. I can remember growing up as a kid in the 50s and early 60s, and 63rd Street was a bustling uh, shopping uh, district. And then I can remember it diving into a horrible kind of ghetto thing where you wouldn't want to be caught dead or alive even in the middle of the day on 63rd Street. And now you're yeah. telling me it's coming back with beds and breakfasts? Yes. No, the area has reju- And it's really a little bit of Jane Jacobs' story about, you know, neighborhoods left to their own devices or local groups leading to their own devices, they actually can help rejuvenate a neighborhood. And it has. And this is a neighborhood that people want to live in. And it's some of these same people, a little bit farther east, where closer towards what's called, you know, the area by uh, Stony Island, where the, where the library would be. Not quite as far advanced in its development. And some of the people there feel threatened. But, I mean... It's threatened good in the sense the neighborhood's going upscale. And the fear, I think, is that these people who are opposed won't get any support, even though there have been very explicit discussions about support, relocation, or rent subsidy, and so forth. So it's, a, it's an ongoing dis- discussion. But if you read the Hyde Park Herald, as I do faithfully every week, it has a long discussion by people writing letters to the editor describing their feelings about the future of Hyde Park and the way it's going to develop. And most are very positive. They want the place to go forward. They have different views, what that means. But they, so there's, well, no. there's not racial tension in the sense, or there isn't a lot of, the only thing is the crime blotter still isn't, is still sometimes pretty full. And there have been, you know, the city of Chicago has pulled out in some of its police protection. And in fact, many of the superintendents, the last two superintendents, have questioned, you know, police are now required to fill out very, very detailed reports, the idea to show accountability. So as a result, a lot of the police are simply not, they're not, they're not stopping anybody. They're not doing their job to enforce crime prevention in the neighborhood. But uh, that's not true around the university because there's a second police force here. So there are two police forces. That's what keeps it somewhat more vital maybe than others. What are you guys, uh, I'm talking to one of the great economists working on human development. What are you up to at the Center for the Economics of Human Development at the University of Chicago? Well, one of the great issues, of course, always, is exactly how you improve a lot of human beings. And namely, how do you measure what improvement is? What are the relevant life skills? And then how do you develop those skills? 
and and how what's the proper role for social policy and i don't mean just governmental policy i mean social policy there are some very strong uh, interventions evidence on interventions showing how if you tell parents certain amount of information that they lack this can have huge effects on their children and the same is true of interventions that occur in the adolescent years human potential is not being fully utilized and i think the pessimism that was i think prevalent in this whole area going back to arthur jensen and and so forth at that time that pessimism is still has a casts a cloud on American society, but I think what we've learned now is that human humans have a lot more flexibility, and we can allow for their development, and we can foster it in con constructive ways. So I've been working on this not only in the U.S. but also in several countries around the world. A lot of time spent in China recently. Okay, so what are the qualities of a human being that allow them to be most effective? And how do those qualities get fostered through social policy? <laughs> well, that's a life's work. You're just asking to describe. But I, I would say that skill, what we've come to understand, and I think this is a huge change. I mean, it shouldn't be a change. I, I, in some ways, I think academic activity can be extremely harmful. You know, academic work is good because we focus on an issue, we popularize it, and it becomes central. So think about IQ. IQ came into the forefront about 100 years ago, 105 years ago, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the first IQ test given by the Army. And then the growth of things like the SAT. And so what happened between 1915, 1920, and the 60s and 70s and 80s is that this whole society became more and more oriented towards the IQ test and more or less oriented around cognition. So even the emphasis in schooling changed. I mean, look, I mean, you know, if you go back to the original pioneers of schooling in America, people like Horace Mann and so forth, Horace Mann is on record as saying, reading, writing, and arithmetic is the least of what we teach in school. And what he was talking about was forming character and forming people on judgment, values, teaching people how to comport themselves, deal with others, and go forth and, and explore. And so it was really creating what we think of as a whole human being. But increasingly, and this is partly a matter of religious uh, religious concerns, uh, you know, a lot of this early work in the Horace Mann type schools was, was or, uh, really organized around the Bible, lessons from the Bible. So what did Jesus say and so forth? Or Aesop's fables. Have you ever read a McGuffey's Reader from the 1890s? No, I have not. Try it. Look at it. There are a lot of McGuffey Reader type Aesop fables. Stories about little, you know, what happens? A couple of bad boys steal a rowboat and go out in the ocean, and then a storm comes up, and they nearly die. And then just by the, you know, the hair of their chinny chin chin, they're able to come back, and they regret, and they go back to school. But the fact is there was a lot of more, there were a lot of moral fables and all of that got weeded out of the system. In fact, the leading case happened here in Illinois. It was literally an atheist in the, uh, went to the Illinois Supreme Court on a case and abolished any kind of religious teaching. But with it, the whole notion that schools are doing anything other than teaching people reading, writing, and arithmetic. And then gradually society has become more and more cognitively focused. Well, that sounds good. I mean, look, when Governor Clinton was governor of Arkansas, when all of these well-meaning officials were talking about how to improve schools, what do they talk about? Nate scores, reading, writing, and arithmetic. They don't talk about character formation. They don't talk about self-control, executive functioning, the way you can help govern your life. That's all cast aside and muted either too, you know, too much intruding in family life or too much um, irrelevant to what's going on. And one of the main lessons that's emerged from this body of work, and I'm proud to have contributed to this, is showing the power of these social and emotional and personality skills in shaping lives. And skills that can be actually cultivated, and skills that can be cultivated not just at the beginning of life, but throughout adolescence especially. I mean, adolescents are growing rapidly. They're developing their personality. 
their prefrontal cortex is really. So what's happening is that we have now new ways to think. What matters is a much richer set of things, much richer than, than just IQ tests or SATs or GREs. What's the, so, what's the evidence for that? I mean, briefly, um, I get reading, writing, and arithmetic. I assume that's problem solving and cognition and uh, being able to process information. I see how that contributes to productivity. Uh, how do these uh, softer skills uh, translate into productivity? And how do you know that they're so important? Why was this overlooked for so many years prior here to, you see what I'm getting at? Well, I'll beat my own breast here in part. Uh, partly inspired by Hernstein and Murray, because I was you know, actively engaged for a while with Murray on that book, although I, I mean, I mentioned, but but what I found, his emphasis was strictly uh, the on The Bell Curve, that famous but, book about IQ and uh, American life. Yeah. If, if you, I don't know if you ever opened the cover of that book. You notice the I first person. I read the book all the way through. Did you realize who was the first person thanked? Well, I did not know that. You're the first person thanked in that book? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure they were very proud that they had your sustained attention, Charles Murray. So then you're responsible for the simplistic econometric inference? No, in that? no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, Derek Neal and I were, I, I literally, Derek was here as a junior professor. Murray contacted me because of some of the work I had done in labor economics. And he asked me if I would read some of the chapters. And I did. I read a, quite a few of his chapters. And what I was interested in, I did warn him. You know who his teacher was, though, don't you? No. Uh, this is a very funny and ironic story for people who are in the end in economics. But one of his teachers you know, he was trained as a political scientist at, at MIT. MIT. I knew that. And his teacher was Doug Hibbs. Doug oh. Hibbs. And you know whose teacher Doug Hibbs was? Who taught Doug Hibbs? No, you're going to tell Arthur me. Arthur Goldberger. Oh. <laughs> so it's a, nice, it's a nice piece of gossip. I used to hit Goldberger about it and say, you know, you launch this, my friend. Goldberger, who I think you might call left of center and who certainly was very critical of the bell curve and of oh, that general it. line of he research. Hated it. If I wanted to get under his skin, I would tell but his him. His intellectual okay. grandchild was Charles Murray. Is that what you say? Well, yes, it was. At least a, a, a short lineage, short generations here. But yes. Anyway, so your work on the bell, or at least in commenting on the bell curve, led you uh, into this uh, into well, this no, area. Well, no, but see, what he was talking about, what those, what Hermstein and Murray were talking about, was cognition. Yeah. And then I started doing work of my own. It's, it was using commonly available data in that book, so I looked at it, and then I started realizing, my God, what this guy is doing is he's making the most elementary confusion in econometrics. He's saying, yes, a coefficient is significant, and therefore it's economically and socially significant. And you ask how much of the very, it's still a question I ask people in audiences today. I ask how, what percent of lifetime variability in IQ, is ex, of lifetime variability in earnings is explained by IQ? It's and, in you the know, single digits, isn't it? It's, it's in the single digits, digits, isn't it? But I've got most of the people that I refer to, like general audiences, 50, 60 percent. Say, no, maybe 10 percent if you're lucky, closer to 4 to 5 percent in most studies. So, well, what, what else is out there? And I started going out and looking at what else was out there. And then I found this whole neglected area of social and emotional skills. And we started having data that we could collect on. And now we've got a big body of data. And they're, they're very, very predictive. And then there's a symbiosis, you know, between the social and emotional skills that motivate people to learn. For me, one of the most epiphanal moments in this regard came studying an early childhood intervention that was conducted in, uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, some 60 years ago, 55 years ago. The Perry Preschool. Yeah. Exactly. I've been working on that. I have a new paper on a new set of papers on it. We now have those kids at 55 years of age. So we know what they've done and we know what their kids have done because a lot of these people have adult children. And what I found in one of the re redeeming, one of the recurring findings in that literature and one of the reasons why Arthur Jensen actually got, his, got into this business about talking about the fact that race differences were immutable was that remember he looked at Head Start and said that the Head Start faded out. There was a boost in IQ and it stopped. Yeah. In Perry, the same thing happened. Within three or four years, the treatment group 
and the control group in Perry have the same IQ. And for a while, this was viewed by the local, uh, the, the Perry analyst as saying, failure. this is a failure. Yeah. But I followed these people. I look, and then suddenly you see, wait, these people are earning more? These people are having less crime? They're more wow. engaged in school? See, something else happened. And that something else that happened was the social and emotional skills. Now, it turns out when we reanalyzed the Perry data, that a lot of measurements were taken that were crude, but still viable measures of social and emotional skill. Jones, and those were uh, excuse me for interrupting. I don't have your camera anymore, but I do have your audio. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there you go. You're back. Continue I'm on. Back. Social no, and emotional skills. And get your face into the center oh, of the Oh, sorry, sorry. Here I am. Yeah, you're yeah. good. You're good. You're good. Okay, very good. Carry no, on. Don't lose your train of thought. No, no, but the, but the train of thought was, to me, that was a great surprise. You know, I used to call it the dark matter of, uh, of developmental psychology. Because while everybody was looking for cognition and IQ, they were missing the key ingredient, which was motivation and engagement. And so these kids were much more likely to do well in school. And the interesting thing was, even though their IQs were no higher than the control group, the treated people had better grades and they had higher achievement test scores. They said, well, what does that mean? Well, remember, good old Charles Murray was talking about the fact that it was IQ. He used yeah. an achievement score for IQ. So what I found in a series of articles was that those achievement scores are heavily weighted by social and emotional skills, how motivated people are. I mean, think about it. It's common sense. If you're going to do 100 questions or 150 questions in a row, you have to be pretty motivated to finish that test. And if you're not motivated, you're not. So the fact of the matter is, is that even Murray, he confused IQ with achievement, and he missed the point. That whole literature missed the point. I mean, I started when I started, Jensen was still alive when I was starting to find it. But that whole group. The, the, the point being, effective human performance depends on more than simply cognitive brain power. Depends correct. also on behavioral, emotional, and attitudinal factors, which exactly. are partly captured by that armed forces qualification test a measure that Murray was using. Not a measure of IQ, but a measure of achievement. Exactly. And, and grades turn out to be very important predictors. And grades involve a lot of effort and interaction with the subject. So these kids came out of Perry much more intellectually engaged. Much well, where, more where do these uh, softer skills come from, emotional? Uh, ah, okay. okay. Okay, now there, and that's something that I'm still actively working on. But the one thing we found that's recurrent is that if you provide children, now this is going back to the early years, some form of mentoring. Mentoring, uh, stimulation of some sort. Uh, we're talking about uh, parenting. Let's say good parenting, guidance, but also what what the developmental psychologists call scaffolding. You know, it's kind of like uh, you're building a, a sculpture. You're going to sculpt. You're going to scaffold. And so what you're going to do is say, okay, I just finished the nose. Now I can go further and I can build a forehead. It's the sense of you are building a person. You but you're doing it because it's a person, you're interacting with that person and you're taking the kid to the next step. But the way you take the kid to the next step matters a lot. You've got to do it with some patience and with some empathy and some attachment. And so there's a whole subject matter in child development psychology, which we're looking at now. We actively are exploring. By the way, I don't want to pretend this is all completely known. This is what makes the work that I'm doing now so exciting. Because now we're measuring these interactions week by week. We're actually showing how this is now not in the U.S. It's in Western China, one of the poorest areas. We can see how the interactions between the parent and the child are leading to the growth of skills on the part of the child. Both in social Western China. Western tell China. Little, tell me a little bit more about this project. This sounds fascinating. It is. Now, this is a place. Western, there's an area called Gansu. Gansu is in one of the poorest areas. It's just south of Xinjiang, where the uh, where the, Uyghur. the Uyghurs are are being yeah. um, uh, are in a, uh, the, the eye of the the world. Yeah. But this is a very poor area, and it's an area where Xi uh, actually worked as a while with, as a young as a young exile during the Cultural Revolution. He was in 
So he became aware of this very poor area. And uh, this intervention is designed to essentially foster parenting and knowledge of parenting on the part of the children. And so there's a randomly assigned uh, home visitor who follows the child for a few years, teaches the parent. So the, in the intervention there, we can study three-way interactions. The interactions of the child with a home visitor, the interaction of the parent with the child with a with a home visitor, and then the home visitor with the child. So it really is a three-way interaction we're studying. And then there's a supervisor who interacts with a home visitor. So it's a very interesting dynamic game among these three parties. So four parties, really. And so what we're learning, though, is that those people who engage the child in an emotionally supportive way and just teach the child. So what's what are they doing? This is something that was tried in Jamaica some some 40 years ago. I'm working I'm working with a group of people in out with a with a study that's still not going outside of Kingston, Jamaica. It's a woman. It's called the uh, Reach Up and Learn study in Jamaica. The China study is patterned after that study. And so what what that neighbor, what it did is it went into those neighborhoods and it essentially taught the parents how to interact with the child. Now that sounds strange. But if you think about it, it turns out, both in the United States and Jamaica and in China, a lot of parents don't really know how to parent. And what do I mean by that? They don't have a clear idea what a normal growth trajectory is for a child, what a child can do, and they often don't understand how powerful they are in shaping the life of the child. So you give them that kind of information. Nobody's being forced to do anything. Just empower people. Almost every caretaker of a young child really wants that child to succeed. There are some abusive parents, but really this is, and you empower them with that information, then that's, it, you will see huge gains. And this, this has happened. I mean, Flavio Cunha, who's at Rice, did some studies with a group in Philadelphia, and now he's doing with a group of people in Houston, where he's now located. And what they found is that these interventions have a powerful role in teaching parents what to expect of their children and what they can do with their children. And when they are told this information, they act on it. So it's something very basic. We took, see the whole idea, remember Dr., what was his name? Oh, Skinner. Remember the Skinner, this guy, the behavioral psychologist? B.F. Skinner? B.F. Skinner. Yeah, with the box, the box. The box, the Skinner box. Yeah. You know, that was about the most atrocious child development strategy you could imagine. You want an anti-Skinner box. You want the mother or the caretaker working closely with the child. And the more encouragement, because what, what's happening is the kid is like a sponge. The child is picking up these ideas and picking up the language and imitating the parent. And the parent plays a powerful, powerful role. And it's just been neglected. It's also well, neglected. What's that? Most policy uh, discussions in the U.S. talking about inequality, there's a lot of talk about schools, but there's not so much talk about parenting. I know. And actually, it scares me a lot that that literally, to me, that I don't quote me too much. <laughs> I don't know how widely re- watched you are. But to me, the whole evil of this process has been kind of schools of education and teachers unions that want to create the idea of the school as an activity in and of itself, detached from society, a separate social agency that is in charge of building children, and not realizing how powerful the parental support for the child in school is, and how much, you know, kids are spending still the majority of their day at home, or at least around their parents and neighborhoods. And literally, I mean, here in Chicago now, in a lot of the districts, some of the school districts like in Inglewood, really poor areas, what you're finding is that parents aren't even allowed in the school. They're afraid that you, they're going to bring in guns or they have to go through metal detectors. And so the, the parent is kind of screened out. The teachers don't want them around because they may be drug uh, addicts or be, have weapons and so forth. So to me, that's the missing link. And the missing link also for job training. What people don't understand is how powerful mentoring is. Programs that take adolescent kids 
and give them advice. Again, I would use the word scaffold, but it's now they're older. The scaffolding is a different activity. But give people advice, give people mentoring are, are, are showing huge effects. I just got a study from Germany a few days ago by Ludiger Wussmann. He probably sent, sends you his material. He's at University of Munich and literally showing very powerful effects on German uh, uh, teenagers, adolescent interventions, precisely of this type of mentoring, fostering children and following them into the workplace and so forth. You're not worried about uh, violating uh, privacy and autonomy of those. You say information. Okay, you can give people information and then they can act on it as they choose. More robust interventions into uh, households uh, might might raise some uh, questions of uh, of privacy or so. Oh, for sure. I think that's, you know, when the Nixon was president, there was a uh, move. Mondale came, across, came up with a bill. Remember that? At that time, when Nixon was president, was Republican president in uh, Democratic House and Senate. And Mondale came up with an early childhood program, a precursor to, you know, kind of expanding Head Start to a more of a national and more well-supported, uh, uh, a better supported level. And Nixon vetoed it for precisely the reason you gave, that you were intervening, that the early years of the childhood were the province of the family. And I agree with that. I mean, to me, the most important piece of child development is the family. I mean, the fa- you've got to get the family on board. So I think of these interventions as empowering. You give them information. You give them options. But you don't sit around telling people, this is what you must do. But most parents, when they find out how important it is to read to the kid, even if they can't read that well, they will actually do this. And that's true in Jamaica. It's true in rural China. It's true in every place we've tried this kind of intervention. So it's very, it, 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 there is a whole literature emerging about the emotional basis of learning. You know, so, you know, the image of the kind of uh, military academy where the kids walk in and salute and, yes. you know, they're, are beaten at night and so forth. And so uh, that, that is not the model for successful child development. But you want the parent to be in the life of the child. It's now, really you know, important. as yeah. I do, how controversial talking about family is, is when you get into the area of race and racial disparities. Uh, I know. When I talk about all that. Yeah. And when I talk about my work, I always get attacked for blaming the victim. And this is by people who are really quite educated, usually African-American, but not all, not all. A lot of people saying you're you're getting into personal lies, like you're saying. And I'm telling people, you know, the Moynihan report was valid. Well, I think it was. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's very important. And I, I think it was stated very badly. And the scientific basis was much weaker than what we have now. But family life is really important. Early fa- Look at the whole discussion today of, of poverty. People are sitting around and talking about growth of inequality. And they want to say, oh, it's because, you know, Zuckerberg has billions and so forth. Well, you know where most of the poverty is coming from. It's at the bottom, obviously, and the inequality is at the bottom. And who are those people? Those are families, single parent families with kids where the mother is stretched to the end. She can't, she has to work. She has very little resources. She doesn't have time to spend with her child. So there is a whole issue that the family is crumbling in some areas and should be part of any valid anti-poverty policy. But I agree with you. It's off the table. It's off the table. Uh, If anybody doesn't know, the Moynihan Report, 1965, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the Negro Family, uh, Case for National Action, uh, chronicling the rise of auto wedlock births amongst African Americans to about 25, 30 percent by the mid sixties and worrying that this would frustrate the goal of the civil rights movement uh, of incorporating African-Americans into the society, basically saying that this was a potential uh, game changer and uh, worrying very much about it. Um, and that was 25%. And you know, what is it? 70% now? What it is it like 30% area. for the country as a whole? Oh, uh, 40, closer to 40. So uh, what what do you propose to do about this? You're saying, uh, can you put the genie back in the bottle on uh, family structure issues? Well, 
I think it's, I mean, the idea, I think Bush was talking about shotgun weddings and things. We're not talking about that. I think what we need to do is think more important, think more comprehensively to recognize that raising a, a kid is an extraordinarily important task. It's societally very important. I think there's been a lot of thinking that housewives and mothering is kind of something that any old mediocre person can do and isn't all that important. And I think once we really, to me, it's really a bizarre that we still don't have, despite Wesley Claire Mitchell's cry, appeal for this 100 years ago about understanding the household, really we don't have a good measure of the value of a good mother on the life of the child. We, we have values of teachers now, some of these studies, <clears throat> but the mother is playing an enormous role. People are saying, what's the value of Perry Preschool? I'm sure that a mother is far more valuable than anything Perry Preschool can do. And the reason is that the mother spends, that's that interaction, it's the guidance, it's shaping the values of the child and staying with the child. But it's not saying the child must do this or that the parent must do that or that there's a preferred lifestyle. Maybe the parents don't want the child to grow up to be uh, you know, one thing or another. I don't think anything in knowledge says that everybody should be doing the same thing anyway. But I do think we really want to recognize the role of the mother. And I think that's, that role has been depreciated a lot. It's been, it's been in the public eye, the view is if the mother doesn't earn any money, then she's not doing anything. And that, I don't know. I, I, I find that I get deeply irritated by that because we know it's probably the most important task in society. It produces all of us. We are all products of our mothers, not just physically being born. It's being shaped by the mother and the father and, and the environment you're in. And I think, I just think we don't recognize the power of that, the importance of it in our policy. Well, one reason I suspect in talking about race that people would be uh, loath to take up this family centered discourse is that it takes away from a focus on discrimination and, and racism. Uh, pe people want to say that uh, the disparities that we see are the result of racism. Uh, what do you say to that? It deeply bothers me. And this is part of the issue that um, that has, uh, I think, it, it's gone bad. And I'm sorry to see that some leading politicians and political figures embrace this idea. One thing that is really important to understand is the power of skills. And I'm talking about this whole vector of skills including the ability to control oneself, the ability to act and to choose. Those are skills that are just vital. Uh, I'm in a neighborhood now. I mean, I, look, I'm old now. I'm older than you, I think, by about four years. That's true. Yeah. That makes me old too, Jim. So be, go easy. Now. Go easy. <laughs> I know, but you're just a young whippersnapper. But fortunately, <laughs> we're both younger than the new president. <laughs> We're youngsters still. We can we can have our shot at a term in a couple of uh, maybe the next decade. No, but seriously, I, I I do I understand what you're saying, and it bothers me because many intelligent people. I had a conversation here at the social science. We were celebrating the social science research building at the University of Chicago was celebrating. I think it was its 75th anniversary. I don't remember which anniversary it was, but there was a celebration. And I was paired with an historian, uh, a psychologist, and uh, I think an anthropologist. We were all just showing the wares of our field. I was representing economics, and I was talking about some of these issues in education. And what bothered me was that when I mentioned some of these issues about the importance of abilities, the importance of the family, that I was denounced by uh, one of my colleagues in history. And it was, again, blaming the victim and that here I was, re you know, repeating all the fallacies of Charles Murray. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I said, I told you that IQ was not fixed. It's not, and it can be changed. We have interventions early enough that do boost IQ. We have evidence on that. We've had evidence on that. And it lasts, it lasts until they're in their forties anyway. And, but early, it has to be early, even earlier than Perry. But nonetheless, I tried to reason and it didn't matter. And so what, what I thought, the, the idea is that skills matter seems to be in the eyes of many, 
to shift the blame onto the family and to the person and to the community and take it away from the idea that there is systemic racism or, yeah. Not, I mean, I, I don't know. Here in Chicago last summer during the riots, uh, I heard some of these young kids on radio, on television actually, just, you know, looking, trying to find, just follow what was going on. And they were going on and saying, oh, how terrible this is. We're, this is the most racist the society's ever been. And I said, God damn it. I lived in the segregated South for a while and I saw racism. They haven't seen it, my guess is. They never saw the benches, the park benches that would see colored only. You know, you'd go to a bus station and there'd be a colored only bathroom and a colored only and a white only bathroom and a yeah. colored only fountain and a white only. That was blatant racism. That was yeah. literally, you had to sit in the back of the bus or blacks had to sit in the back of the bus. That was so naked. That's gone. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is a, you know, enlightened figure and that race isn't still a question, but it bothers me that we have professional race monitors that seem to be stirring this up. And, and this is what, see, the reason why I mentioned Hispanics earlier is that I think where I see some hope in all this is that Hispanics still, I think, have the desire and even their leaders to kind of lead to their gradual or maybe even rapid integration into the mainstream economic society. Different, you know, different, maybe different values. They don't know. They will, they will celebrate weddings differently. They may eat different foods, but they still see themselves as aspiring going forward. And I see some hope there, but some of the leaders I see here, but still, look, I look around me. and yeah, You're saying that in contrast to blacks? I'm saying that there is an emerging difference. I'm not saying it's there. But the Hispanic leaders have been very shy to sort of pick up on some of these themes they could have picked up on. Some have, but they don't want to see themselves to the same extent as victims, so much as people who have opportunity to go out and, and integrate into the rest of the society. What bothers me, though, is I look around me. I've seen, and you've seen it too, tremendous integration of African Americans into society. I mean, Chicago in the 1950s and 60s, they were some very, very poor people. I mean, literally, you drove around a lot of, you know, rusted cars, people sitting on the stoops, people very, they really see, I remember even in the early 70s when I was here, came here uh, uh, to the university, I said to myself, you know, I mean, some people would run into me, they didn't have any insurance, and these were people who just seemed very desperate. I don't see such people. I mean, I think you literally see people driving pretty good cars and, and the, the, the level of the level of uh, poverty. Now, you go to Inglewood and you go out to, to the west, you know, Austin, those two neighborhoods in Chicago, you still will see some very depressed conditions. But if you go down in the south side of Chicago, like look at Chatham. You grew up in Chatham, right? I did. I was, I, I was my first four years of my life were spent in Chatham. You go there. I was just there recently. The driver's license uh, test has to be taken nearby, and I drove through. Perfectly fine houses. The housing stock is fine. The neighborhoods are fine. The lawns are well tended. The people there are fearful of some of the drive-by shootings and the gangs. But they themselves are living what looks to me like a pretty affluent or at least good middle-class life. And I think the data support that. There's just this, so what? What is, the, what is the estimate of the number of African Americans living in poverty? About 25%, maybe a little less. But 75% aren't. And there are a lot of achieving people. I, the neighbors, my neighbors happen to be here. You know, Obama's best friend is right behind me, literally my house. He has a big mansion, bigger than mine. And you go down the block, two, two houses down, you have people. And so it's, it's, the fact but but you know, you know the litany. They're going to say, "What about the wealth gap?" Uh, they're they're going to say, uh, "What about implicit bias?" They're going to say, "What about the studies where people send resumes and they send testers and they show evidence of discrimination?" Uh, you know, they they're going to say, "What about over incarceration, uh, the ra racial disparity?" Uh, so they, they're going to have their their uh, list of uh, grievances uh, that claim to be evidence of an ongoing 
racial bias. I mean, all these people talking about structural racism, systemic racism, um, are they, are they uh, imagining it? Well, I was thinking before we met together, I don't know if you remember the conference we both went to at Stanford in the mid nineties. Do you remember that conference? It was held by the Stanford Law School. It was on race in America. John Donahue was there. I was there. You were there, I remember. You were wearing a very fancy hat at the time, I remember. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't impressive. remember the conference, but I do remember the hat. <laughs> yeah. No, but, uh, but you know who else was there? Was Mazarin Banerjee. Aha. Uh-huh. And she was talking. For the, for the first time, I heard about implicit bias. I'd never heard of it. And so she's a lively person. At the time, she was at Yale. She later moved to Harvard. Yes. And so I was intrigued by this. And so literally, from that conference, you may not remember me too actively, because I spent most of the rest of the day and into the evening with Banerjee, because I was intrigued by her evidence on implicit bias. And we argued into the night. And we continued the argument by whatever form of (coughs) communication was used, probably email then, by by then, I'm not sure. Yeah. the, the the thing that I said then, Susan Fisk was there too, remember? Yeah, social psychologist uh, at Princeton. Social psychologist. She got really upset with me. I don't, you don't remember these things, but I remember this very well. She got very upset with me because she was talking about saying, you know, people don't get their desires. And I said, well, there's something called a budget set. And, you know, I, I and it's just. And they can't have their, everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I said, I want to be president. And uh, so, so anyway, the, with Banerjee, I was really intrigued with it. And I remain intrigued to this day. And I had yet to see a good study. And so I said, you know, I think you're probably right. But have you ever controlled for the history that those people who took your test have experienced? Let, let, let me explain to people that what she's finding is that in an effort to associate items which might be race or gendered, people are slower to be able to make certain kinds of associations when the object of their uh, association is a black or a woman. They're slower to be able to connect it with positive attributes. uh, And that's an implicit measure of the extent to which they assume that blacks or women don't possess those positive attributes. Did I get that right? I just want people to understand what we're talking about. No, no. The idea is that many people have used that data to argue that we're innately racist because there are these differential responses. When I look at a picture, I'm flashed a series of pictures and I see a a young black man with a certain profile and I see a young white woman and a young Hispanic male and various guises and I have reactions that are pro or con. There is a systematic pattern that people are generally, many people anyway, are more fearful or show more negative attitudes towards African Americans. And, uh, but not necessarily towards other minorities, even like Hispanics, as I understand, but I'm not sure about that. And Asians, no, if anything, Asians the other way. So, so yes, that was, yes, that's the argument. But, but what I was arguing with her, and I would still argue to this moment, this recurring and undeveloped model of statistical discrimination and experience so that people get these experiences. I mean, imagine you grew up in an era like in the South in the 1930s and 40s. And so you had this image of African-Americans with these people who walked on the other side. They lived on the other side of the tracks. They, They were literally lowly. You couldn't, they couldn't do certain things. They weren't very well educated. Of course, that was because the education wasn't given them, but put that to the side. You develop certain experience patterns. And so your gut reaction, and probably in 1930, was that the average African-American was not that bright. And I think that was the view, because the average African-American had two or three years of education and literally didn't know much. Uh, and wasn't really able to lo- know much. And I think that... You're saying the implicit biases that she detects might be the consequence of people having life experiences in which the group against which the biases expressed were seen in the experience of the observer to have been uh, less educated, less articulate, 
less, uh, you know, successful. Well, no, I'm using that as an extreme, but I'm thinking more recently about things like crime. Uh, for example, if you think of crime statistics, or if you think about where you're going uh, down a neighborhood or a certain neighborhood or a district, uh, most people will will use uh, uh, signals. They will use messages that are sent by the neighborhood, by the people. And there are certain correlations and associations with certain neighborhoods. So for me, and I would try to get with her, I've never seen a good study. This is like 25 years ago. I'm going to teach this next quarter because I really want to try at least to stimulate some work. But literally, I wonder how much, if your experience is different, suppose that you grew up in a neighborhood, uh, say in looking at Chicago, like Kenilworth or one of the north suburbs, there are very affluent African-Americans living there. And my guess is their experience, uh, the experience of the average person at New Trier is going to be very, very different with African, with race than with somebody living in the south side of Chicago who's been mugged or, or so forth and so on. So I think experience plays a role. Experience, but experience has this whole social history. It's what your grandparents told you. It's what, it's what you've heard. So there's a, you know, it's very hard to, when, when, when the, when these behavioral economists and laboratory experimentalists do their studies, they kind of believe you can throw away everything you came into the experiment with and they st you start anew, but you don't. And so to me, it would be extremely valuable. And I am not seen it done. It should be done to get people with different life experiences to answer those Mazarine Banerjee papers, uh, uh, questions and see what their implicit bias is. And I would bet that the bias is considerably less for people who have had only positive experiences with anybody. And look, I'm telling you, if you did her implicit bias test in some places in Northern Georgia, remember, remember what was the name of that movie um, uh, about the, the canoers in the, uh, oh, what's the name of it? Are you talking about... Uh... Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Deliverance. <laughs> Deliverance, that's it. Now, suppose that you, you went and gave <laughs> these tests to the, to, the, to the crackers in North Georgia living yeah. near that street. My guess is you'd have even greater implicit bias. But the, the critic is going to answer here, okay, you can explain the bias. It's uh, per, in part due to previous life experience, but it's still bias, and it still has its effects. And all we're yeah. saying is the bias exists. And that's part of what we need to, to re-educate people uh, about. Well, education, I always favor. I'm, I, I'm, it's a, I'm definitely uh, favoring my own group here by saying that. But I also believe, though, that what the danger comes is this notion of systemic racism, that we're hardwired, that somehow we are, dis we are hardwired to think that a certain okay. group of people is inferior or superior. I don't think we are. Uh, you see it in children. Children don't. Children don't. They, they, children accept people as they are. The reason why they start differentiating is because they're told, or maybe they have some adverse experience later. So I think, though, that that what bothers me is that it, it, if it's stated as a legal matter, it ignores the fact that that things like promoting people's skills, promoting their schooling promoting their socialization, promoting their acceptance into the larger society is one way to, manu to gain acceptance in the larger society. So policies that include and promote and give people agency, I think, is what we want. I worry about these other policies just creating this adversarial culture. And I, I honestly believe, and I think we saw it play out in this election, that there were groups of politicians who really wanted to actively cultivate racial turmoil for their benefit. And I'm not saying there were only Democrats or only Republicans. I think there was a serious issue where race was used. And it has been used. I mean, it was certainly used in the 1950s and 60s in the South, for sure. And, and even used in the 1880s. You know the history of Jim Crow as well as I do. And so there's always this political uh, edge which kind of create foments difficulty if it will help if you're splitting the electorate in some way, will help. But it bothers me that you're not thinking about 
realistic options. And the ob- I still believe that integration, that inclusion, that acceptance is the only way to go. And I, at least within my own lifetime, I've seen an enormous advance. I mean, I look around Chicago. You may think Chicago is this racist, violent place. Look, the guys who were rioting downtown did not live near North Michigan Avenue. These were not black lawyers who came down uh, from Winnetka yeah. and started rioting. These are people who were out to get some resources. So maybe they thought this is an opportunity. But the, the attitude was such that it, it, cre- it, it, it was an opportunistic exploitation. I understand that. Fine. But what worries me is if it cements into something hard where there's like an us versus them, and especially the idea that we are in this racist society, where do we go with that? Where do, where do we take this? We say, okay, so I can't talk to you. You're black. I'm white. Ooh, no good. Please go back to South Africa. We'll, each of us can go and live in our segregated units. So it doesn't go anywhere, this argument, I think. That's what bothers me. And it, it, it shuts down all the other arguments that I think are valid and, and have been useful. And it denies the progress that's occurred. There is no deny that African-American progress has been real. And I think some of the studies that we see, you mentioned the wealth gap, okay? Yeah. Uh, there is a wealth gap. There's no question about it. Uh, and uh, you ask, well, what's the sort? Is that racism? Or does that represent other sources of insecurity in the family? Well, we think about family life. I mean, literally, if you're living in situations where families are divided, there's a lot more uncertainty about personal life and so forth, then that's not going to be a form of building wealth in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in relationship. So I think, I think though that, so I can't say I have a full theory of the wealth gap. Yeah, I was about to try to, uh, in a couple of sentences, offer the implicit theory that uh, you're saying people are making decisions about acquiring and accumulating assets. They're thinking forward to what they're going to leave to their children and so forth. They're making risk benefit decisions uh, and, you know, they're deciding whether they're going to business for themselves or whatever. And that somehow, uh, a, a family focus is associated with decision making that is more uh, wealth generating. And uh, am I am I wrong about that? Is, is well, that's a, not the whole story by any means. I think. See what what's what's really surprised me is the lack of community structure among African Americans here in Chicago. The example I like to give is. Uh, I mean, I drive around the Chicago neighborhoods a lot. Because of the guns and gangs, I've been driving around less. But, you know, the day that Harold Washington was elected, I made a whole point of walking in all around the South Side, way down to 90th Street and everywhere. And everybody was smiling. It was just a happy day for the all of Chicago. I think uh, now what I see is that there is a fragmentation of the African American community. And I, I understand that. I accept that. But the question is not just to dwell on why that happened. It may have been slavery. There may have been, and I, I know for a fact that there are people living today, there are grandmothers and great grandmothers who were living in the Jim Crow South. I mean, they literally had to uh, say, yes, you know, they, they, they couldn't even refer to people by the name Mr. They were basically just anti somebody or other. And so there was really a true racial separation. You can see it in the movies from the thirties and forties. Yeah. I mean, Mo- and, and Amos and Andy, for example, the whole picture of blacks was very, very different. So no question that, and, and so I don't think there's any question. And I do think blacks suffered enormous amount of discrimination. We know it was on the books, but it ended formally. It ended formally. And I think African-American progress has been enormous in that regard. It's just unfortunate that when the the legislation changed and opportunities opened up, some of those historic opportunities were shut down, like manufacturing and, you know, meatpacking, places where manufacturing just shut down for everybody, black and white, but blacks were especially it in places like Chicago. But the the fragmentation, 
And so to me, one of the one concern that I don't have a good answer to, I really don't, and I wish I did. But for example, I drive down Halstead Street, and Halstead starts, you know, about where the old stockyards were, a little bit north. Well, it starts very far, but where I'm looking is on the south side, Halstead. Yeah. And the initial district, Bridgeport area, is primarily Hispanic. And you drive down there, you'll see a street, not prosperous, but what you'll see is a street with lots of shops, you know, lots of lots of vitality in the neighborhood. Yeah. And then at some key point on Halstead, it switches over. It becomes predominantly African-American. The number of shops, greatly diminished. The level of activity, diminished. The level of care and the housing stock and so forth diminished. And I ask myself, and I still ask myself, why is that? And I don't have a theory. I mean, I, I, I really don't. The fragmented African-American community, I don't understand. I don't. But what worries me is the derivatives here. And what worries me is that people who don't want to see a way out, a lot of African-Americans have taken a way to advance themselves. And I think that's exactly what we want to do. I don't think we want to set up an apartheid type system. I don't think we want to create a class of victims, a class of clients who are dependent on the state or dependent on somebody else. After all, we're in this life, we're the only ones who can actually take care of ourselves in the end. And what worries me is that we're creating, and it's not just African Americans. It's, I'm there, you know, there are plenty of, of, uh, Appalachian whites, uh, plenty of, uh, people who are very, very poor living in these communities. I don't know how much, do you ever get out much to these very poor uh, white areas like in Southern Illinois? No, I don't. I confess that. I do not. Okay. But if you drive through those areas, they're almost all white, almost all white. And if you go into those areas, you'll have a sense of despair. No better in any way than an inner, inner city Chicago and Inglewood. You get a group of people who just feel they've given up on life, and they're the ones taking opioids. It's primarily yeah. these whites, uh, these uh, and these Appalachian whites, and these whites living. I have a I have a cousin uh, living in uh, rural Oklahoma, and the little town that my parents came from and grew up in. That town is desolate, and it's filled with people taking meth and taking opioids of all yeah. sorts, and uh, and they're wards of the state. You know that book that was published a few years ago, What's the Matter with Kansas? Yeah. It correctly pointed out that these people are actually wards of the state, all white, by the way, but they vote Republican because they like to think of themselves as John Wayne type figures. So that's more of a matter of presence, but literally not accepting. So we do have people who are very dependent, and that's what we don't want. I mean, it seems to me that's what life is all about, isn't it? You're trying to reach for something. You may not succeed fully, but to give people hope. And what worries me is a political process that's kind of creating people as dependents. I, I, I've had this very ugly feeling in this last year that in some sense, America may become the state that, ha that has a democratically elected, determined apartheid, <laughs> that we will actually end up with a separation of race, which as a result of public policy, will create cleavages, not bring the society together. But that may that's, be overly stating it. That's a grim prospect. Uh, it is I a think, grim prospect. Yeah. I, I was just going to uh, thank you, Jim. I, I think we've uh, got a good conversation on the record here. I appreciate you being <laughs> willing to give us some of your time. Uh, James Heckman, uh, Henry Schultz, professor of uh, uh, distinguished service professor, I should say, at the University of Chicago. My friend, uh, very good to talk to you, Jim. Good talking uh, to you. Well, come back to South Side sometime, and I'll I'll show you around. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot. I guess we have to wait for the pandemic to be over, though. Oh no, you yeah no, I wouldn't recommend anybody traveling anywhere. But yeah, no, I think you'd be surprised and pleased. But how many of the South Side neighborhoods look very vital? But the overlay is the gangs and these other groups that that somehow terrorize the good burgers of the South Side. So you really are dealing with people and, and you can go, I mean, down, literally down on Calumet where I grew up uh, as a little kid, um, there are these neighborhood watch parties. The, the women will stand there 
They will stand, they will actually sit at the blocks at the intersections and will report anything that looks dangerous to the police immediately. And so these individuals are patrolling and making their neighborhoods safe. So the effort is good. These, these are good, good people and they, they, they want the best for their kids and for themselves. That's the part I don't understand, the fragmentation. Maybe someday we can have a, we don't have to be taping our conversations, but I would like to get your thoughts about the wealth gap. And I really would like, and this contrast between Hispanics and Blacks, it's just recently emerging, but I see, I kind of, well, you saw the way that a lot of Hispanics voted for Trump on the last election. And, uh, well, let's have another conversation. It doesn't have to be on the record, but I look forward to that. Okay, very good. Have a good day. Have a good Thanksgiving.